and then um, abatacept uh, is, is an infusion. It's a co-stim inhib inhibitor. Uh, and abatacept is uh, being looked at for giant cell arteritis. Um, but it's probably its role in uveitis. I've been a little underwhelmed, but I'm interested to hear what others think about this. Uh, rituximab and ocrelizumab um, are, are, have been part of our arsenal mainly rituximab. We use a lot for these uh, antibody-based diseases, and ocrelizumab is the newest addition looking at it uh, for, um, for multiple sclerosis. But then I wanted to kind of close with biosimilars, and biosimilars is something that's really going to be important, not just for inflammatory disease, but also retina. We're, we're probably about a year to two years away from being flooded with biosimilars. And, and so just for those who are unfamiliar, um, the biologic is an antibody. And these antibodies have quite long um, patent lives, um, but eventually their patents run out. And, and to help with competition, Congress eventually passed a bill that said, if once the patent runs out, you can start to make these biologics and you don't have to repeat all the trials that get it, got these biologics approved for various diseases. So we're gonna, we're, we're, we're in the thick of this right now, uh, Remicade, has plenty of biosimilars, at least two. Rituximab, I believe, has two now. And Humira is probably going to have three or four starting in 2023. And, and um, you know, so the space is going to get really crowded, not to mention the retina drugs. And I think it's going to be interesting to see if we think it's going to work as well. The long and the short is we don't have enough data just yet. Um, but uh, I, I know I've talked to you, you know, I, I think we're here for the, the great, you know, questions. So I'm going to stop and say, let's get those questions going. Well, thank you so much, Raj. Um, Dr. Shah has uh, at least two more eyeballs to save tonight, so <laughs> that's why he was. Uh, yeah, joining us very much. yeah, he's that's why he's he's in his uh, surgery. He doesn't just wear that for fun, so he's actually in the operating room right now. So, uh, so thank you for taking time between cases. Wait, so I, I, should, I shouldn't wear this to the bar to to get attention. Yeah, my I'll get free drinks. Yeah, I like to wear my scrub for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> is there a way that we can retrieve uh, questions from anybody who has them? Um, I don't know if people unmute themselves or if there's a chat that they can submit things to. What is? Yeah, I mean, I just want before we head into Q and I just want to kind of quickly, yeah, sort of, uh, I, I, I kind of echo what Dr. Shot has said here is that when I was a, a research fellow with Dr. Foster 12, 13 years ago, 2008, 2010, and there was very little that's actually approved or be, I mean, there might be a lot of stuff that was gone undergoing um, investigation, but <laughs> there was actually very little things that were approved. Humira was not even approved, even though we were using Humira for uveitis off label at that time, just like, you know, all that Dr. Foster has been <laughs> sort of trailblazing all his career and he's been using these drugs off label. He was way ahead of the game. Uh, but yeah, when I was a research fellow, there was really just you know, the, the oral anti-metabolites, uh, cyclosporin, some of these older drugs. Not that they don't work, they, not that they're ineffective, but you want more options for your patient because not everybody will tolerate your methyl methotrexate. Not everybody is going to respond under cyclosporin. So it is nice to have all these um, newer drugs. So and, and now that I'm actually practicing uveitis day to day, it's amazing how many new, uh, more new drugs are available uh, to us now, even though, you know, technically, there's only not that many FDA approved drugs per se, but there's a lot more biologics in the rheumatology space that we could actually start borrowing. Uh, for example, um, in, in the next month or two, we are actually uh, starting a, an investigator initiated trial at Mercy, uh, looking at TALTS, uh, which is a, a subcutaneous injection that's given um, patients give to themselves, kind of like Humira, but you do that once a month. Uh, and we're doing the new trial involving that for posterior uh, segment uveitis. Um, and um, so we're looking forward to you know seeing it's it's an anti um, interleukin seventeen uh, inter, uh, it's a um, an attack antagonist to interleukin seventeen which is a pro inflammatory mediator uh, that's been shown to play a pretty prominent role in ocular inflammation so we're hoping that you know maybe you know one way or another positive or negative we want to know whether this biologic will work so that's just one of the many examples that Dr Shaw was talking to there's a lot of trials going on some of them are uh, conducted by pharma some of them are being done by uh, private practices or academic centers in, sort of as a investigator initiated trials because uh, unless you the, the um, unless the doctors are taking charge of trying these things out a lot of time uh, there may not be enough uh, financial interest for the companies to to run trials on uveitis patient because as you all know uh, very well by now uveitis is uh, rel relatively speaking as an orphan disease in ophthalmology right you it's not going to be uh, you're not going to find that many patients with uveitis compared to rheumatoid arthritis. 
uh, or psoriatic arthritis. So it is important for us to continue to have these type of uh, support, um, both from pharma, from donor, and to kind of just get these type of things going. Yeah. And uh, do you have anything? You want to well, add? I was going to say that Dr. Tang and I yesterday even were on a call to a major insurance carrier here in Massachusetts regarding a policy they have on an quote unquote investigational drug that's already been FDA approved for posterior uveitis, which just highlights how difficult it is to get some of these medications approved for anybody to use. There's very few drugs that are used for these orphan diseases that are actually FDA approved because of how infrequently they're encountered and how hard it is to set up trials for them. It's very expensive um, to do so. And for the drug companies, it, it simply is not feasible, um, which is why the few FDA approved medications, it's great that we have them, including our sponsor tonight. But uh, you know the types of things that we have to go through in order to get any of these medications actually even to be approved by insurance is quite frankly pretty horrendous. Um, Francis could tell you all about that if she ever wanted, if you wanted to pick her ear about that. So um, there's, a, there's a lot out there. Uh, there's a lot uh, new uh, available to us, much more than like Dr. Chang said, when it was available back in the times when we were fellows, which is almost the same time. And um, it's just an exciting time, but there's a lot that we still need to learn and a lot uh, of, of uh, investigational work we have to see whether these things work or not for people um, for their various diseases. So. Yeah, and it's important. <clears throat> I know many of you here already, uh, we, you know, you're a uh, longtime supporter <laughs> of uh, OIUF. So I, I know it, uh, we always uh, sort of our main message that we uh, give patients whenever we do patient advocacy group is that you, you really have to be your own advocate as well. So sometimes it helps that um, for the patients uh, uh, to you know, call up the insurance and, and try to fight the insurance and say, listen, my doctor really wants me to try this because I'm running out of options. And you know, if you can actually uh, play, a, play an active role in that uh, process, I think it will really help. Some, sometimes it, does, it goes a long way. Well, actually I wonder, you know, I, there's one I skipped on here on purpose because you know, I, we, you know, I'm talking to some of the groundbreaking uh, users of Actar right now. But you know, for those that are unfamiliar, Actar has is, is the drug that uh, Peter was referencing here, which is an ACTH uh, drug that also splits off into other uh, peptide type hormones such as alpha MSH, and it's really been an on-label, um, you know, drug that that's another big weapon in our arsenal. And the interesting thing is, it had it's had the FDA uh, approval for what we do, but just the data is, is now just now emerging. And one of the exciting studies, I believe Mercy has completed, what isn't it on, on renal vasculitis? Can you guys speak on that a little bit? Sure, that was published a couple months ago in retinal vasculitis, which is an incredibly difficult um, problem to treat uh, no matter what you use. But we were able to show efficacy over the course of using this medication for six months. And um, <clears throat> at three months, the patients were showing dramatic improvement to the point uh, where they met our endpoint of 50% improvement in at least 50% of the patients. That's very difficult to do for retinal vasculitis, only adding a single agent in patients that are active. So it's very nice that we were able to show that. And, it, and the more of these types of studies that come out, the more sort of uh, uh, we have to show the insurance companies of why they need to start approving these medications when we ask for them. And it's not like we ask for them for everybody. Somebody doesn't just walk in and we, you know, recommend whatever medication, you know, it, it depends on the person. Uh, but when we ask for it, you know, we really try to expect to, to get it to be approved. And <clears throat> these types of trials are great. Um, so that was a really successful trial. It was finally published again, like I said, two months ago, it was the first of any of the investigator initiated trials studying Akthar in ocular inflammatory diseases since been another one studying um, severe dry eye that's been published as well, and another one, several coming out for different types of ocular inflammation. We have a follow-up study to that same one that we did um, that shows a, a separate population of patients that we'll be starting to put together the data for very soon, and will make it even, I think, more uh, convincing that this medication is very, very good in, using, uh, in use for ocular inflammation. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think one of the nice things about Actar, as opposed to other drugs, is it's such a broad label. And I think, you know, we're, you know, we love Humira. Uh, it's been a big game changer, but it's only got the indication for pan intermediate posterior uveitis. Uh, if you're just going to use the uveitis indications, you know, the nice thing about when you read the uh, the label for Actar, it does cover almost everything under the sun from intersecting inflammation, pemphigoid, you know, orbital inflammatory. So. It's got a lot of things we can we can apply it to, and I think 
Uh, we all, all of us who take care of UBITIS know that everyone, you know, gets challenging cases where we try everything, we empty the shelf, and it's nice that we have yet another weapon and we need more. Um, but I think that's the most, another exciting aspect about ACTA. You know, I think Dr. Shaw just said something that triggered something. You know, there's a lot of people who tune into these talks who don't have uveitis. Uveitis is a term that is often blanketed to mean all types of ocular inflammation, but there are several people with other things like scleritis, ocular surface diseases like pemphigoid, bad allergy, whatever it is, you guys are also paying attention to these talks, orbital inflammation, and you guys are in the same group of patients that we treat that are left behind by most other eye doctors, and, and, and you need all the help that we are help trying to provide with the research and education that we're providing through the foundation, including in talk sessions like this. So just remember that you're also being remembered in this group of uveitis. Yeah. It, in, it includes all of you as well. Yeah, because the treatment ultimately, <laughs> are they all very, very similar. Yeah, so in terms of how you address, at, at least when it's non-infectious, the, 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 the way we approach is very similar. Um, so I see a question here uh, from uh, Sue. I guess she wrote it in the chat so everybody can actually read her question if you open your chat box. But uh, basically Sue asks, uh, is there a time frame for when Humira is most effective or how long does it take to really start working? in treating bilateral posterior uveitis that was steroid resistant despite two years of oral prednisone and having tried three injection, uh, injections of Avastin. All right, so that's actually a pretty, um, that's a big question because it involved, there are many, many, uh, many components to it. Um, uh, so I'll, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll say usually, um, you know, for Humira, we says biologics actually in, in our experience tend to work a little faster than your traditional oral uh, anti-metabolites like methotrexate or Celsep or Imuran, uh, maybe, but we usually, it depends, you know, usually we load the patient with a loading dose of 80 milligrams. And then on, on the, a week later, we do the 40 milligrams. And after that, we do 40 milligrams every other week. That is the, uh, so the, the FDA label, uh, but we often use off label because we use it much more frequently. So we would give, a, a, in our experience, a lot of uveitis patients do require weekly Humira injection. Uh, so it's hard to say how fast it works, but typically I would say I tell patients, you know, once I start young Humira, especially if you do the loading regimen, somewhere between probably six to eight weeks is starting to um, work. Uh, whereas if you do the oral, uh, traditional oral and time metabolize me, I take time because sometimes up to two, three months even. Uh, so that's sort of the first part of your question. Uh, do you guys agree with me, Raj? Humira? You know, that's a great question. In my hands, Humira is most effective when I, I run it with another drug. Mm -hmm. So I almost always use, probably like y'all, um, I use Humira in combination with an anti-metabolite. I find it's more effective for the cases That's I'm seeing. Um, and, and, you know, there's always this concern about dual, you know, more than one immune suppressant. Um, I think when you come out of the foster house, you're a little less uh, timid about doing what needs to be done. So I think, um, I, I, you know, a lot of my patients are combination therapy, and I find um, the timing just depends on the disease. I think there's some where you knock out of the park. Um, I think in the, the really early JIAs, uh, it works great uh, mm -hmm. with like a methotrexate or another anti-metabolite. For the really complex, you know, I think the problem when they have lived with the disease for a while, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I find it takes a long time to really get that inflammation ramped down if they've been yep. with it for a while. Yep. And that's something Dr. Foster has always ta taught us in the training is that you got to get the inflammation down very quickly. Otherwise, the longer you let it linger, the, the harder the... Uh, the, uh, the, the process becomes hard uh, to control. Uh, and, uh, and just like Raj says here, uh, Humira very rarely in our hands is used as a monotherapy because insurance oftentimes would dictate that we try the oral stuff anyway. So yeah, I totally agree. In my practice, very few patients actually just take Humira by itself. It's always combined with the anti-metabolites because uh, I think they have synergistic um, um, efficacy. Um, <clears throat> as far as you know, you, uh, Sue, you mentioned uh, being steroid resistant despite two years of oral prednisone. I think, mm -hmm. I think I can imagine it's very high dose oral prednisone for two years because that would probably not have been fun. Um, so I think what we see a lot of time is patients are on these very sort of half-baked dose of oral prednisone, like 10 milligrams, 15 milligrams, and they just ongo and just taking that same dose forever. Um, and that oftentimes is very ineffective. Uh, and I think we, if we really want to know, hey, if is if okay, I've done all the workup on the patient. I, I'm pretty certain the uveitis is, is autoimmune and not infectious. And anyway, 90% of the uveitis in North America is autoimmune anyway. Um, so, so just say, you know, that then, you know, if your patient is autoimmune uveitis, <clears throat> you, you usually try to 
um, blast the inflammation away with a high dose prednisone, whether it's 60 milligrams of oral pred or IV steroids, whatever, or even local injection of steroids, just to calm that eye down. Then you start a patient, you, you transition the patient on the steroid sparing program. I think that's the appropriate thing to do rather than putting somebody on 20 milligrams, 30 milligrams for month and month and month and not putting them on something that's steroid sparing. So I think that that's the trouble that I think a lot of patients tend to run into when they're treated by other doctors who, you know, and some ophthalmologists, I find that, you know, eye doctors, so they don't really like to play with high dose prednisone, but they feel comfortable somehow doing like 20 milligrams forever. <laughs> uh, that's actually probably worse for the body in, in, in our, in our opinion. So um, yeah, you, you want to blast it hard and taper fast. So Peter, I, there's a question from Claudia. Do you see? Yep. Hey, Claudia. Yeah, well. Current first line therapy for birth uh, <laughs> and also what about retinal vasculitis in the pediatric population? So for birdshot, I don't know if it's changed much. Dr. Foster devised a concoction of medications that he thought was best suited to help treat this disease. And some of you might be familiar with those in the way of Celsept and Cyclosporin. Uh, which are both oral medications given together and sometimes later uh, using something like Remicade. And, and, and of course, we've used all manner of different combinations to treat those problems. I don't think it's really that much different, to be honest. With the addition of, uh, of other things that we can use, I, I can't recall anything specifically that's been more favored than not. We certainly, I think, try the same things to begin with, but go to other things as needed. So not, nothing whole new there, unfortunately, Claudia. And Dr. Casablanco is uh, one of our former fellows uh, who's practicing uveitis as well. And re retinal vasculitis in the pediatric population, um, <clears throat> it's a tough one too. We, we use a lot of the same sorts of medications that we would typically use for pediatric uveitis of any kind. Um, and you have to consider in younger patients the types of complications that uh, we would worry about, I mean, you know, we don't tend to use things like alkylating agents very often because of their effects on fertility. Um, <clears throat> we have to uh, otherwise, you know, just attack the inflammation like we would anything else. We, we use a lot of the same medications mm -hmm. as we do for adults, including combination biologics and antimetabolic therapy, like Dr. Chang was just alluding to in this previous, you know, comment about the Humira. And those work um, pretty well. I think anything with retinal vasculitis tends to need combination therapy. A lot of our patients who were on that trial were already on other medications and had Actar added to their regimen. Uh, so they weren't really um, almost ever on only Actar, even though the ones that I think that only used that medication also showed some efficacy. I can't recall offhand. Um, it, it, was just a, it was just a good trial, but um, you know, that's, that's something that you'll oftentimes have to combine things to help treat, especially if it's more significant. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think one of the things that's lacking in our field that I think um, Dr. Foster and, and Dr. Chang and Messi have done a brilliant job of is, is really pushing our understanding of treatment ahead with longitudinal data from their vast collection of patients. And I think when you talk about birdshot, uh, as, as you know, Claudia, the you know, the, some of the best data, the largest data that's ever been published came out of Mercy. Um, and, and I think it's, it helps us understand just the power of, of, of more than one drug therapy. And I think part of the problem, I think, is that there's um, the way we all do immune suppression in the world of UPS across the country is, is highly variable. I think there are some in, the, in our field who are a little more conservative, who just start with Celsept. And I think those of us who train with Foster, we are very comfortable for Birdshot in particular going multiple therapies quickly out of the gate. Um, I found, you know, for my patients here, um, I've got to be a little more phased in, um, in that uh, I think they're, they tend to be a little more country folks. So I, I will, rather than start both at the same time, I'll, I'll start one and I'll see them back within three to four weeks and start the second one, which I think for the, the life history of birdshot is probably not a bad thing for their outcome. You know, I think when they get go to a, a, a mecca center like Mercy, I think they're, you can, you can give them a long list of what to do. And, and I think the people who are Mercy patients want to do everything on your list um, all at the same time, all at once. So uh, I have to do a little more phase and approach, I think, with the patients I take care of. But I, but I fully agree with multiple therapy for, for birdshot. It's very different. You know, everybody's variable. It depends on the patient. Some people are overwhelmed by the amount of information they get from each visit. I'd say that most patients probably are. And, you know, that has to be taken into account when you start a new type of therapy, too. 
because um, you want something that you to do to be understood by the patient so it actually works and they know why they're taking it and and they'll actually take it and be consistent so uh, there's mm -hmm. a lot that goes into each visit with each patient so it's 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 mm -hmm. No, nothing's cookie cutter about any of this, you know, yeah. everything's very individualized. Um, yeah, one thing about birth shot, uh, my common, uh, and I agree, everything Stephen Rogers says here, birth shot, I, what, what I want to say is birth shot is a very often undertreated disease. Uh, we've seen so many patients like that because a patient, it's very deceptive. <clears throat> Uh, patients can come in with 20-20 vision, central visual acuity, but they're having a lot of complaints. They're talking about problem with their nighttime vision, their color. There's just some things are some things are just different visually, because over receptors, it's over receptors are actually being being uh, affected. So, uh, so you don't want to just take that 20-20 and say, oh, the patient is fine. Just just because there's no macular edema, oh, the patient is fine. Uh, we uh, there's there, I, I think there's a lot of patients with birth shot that's very very undertreated. The local doctors think that oh yeah well, you're totally fine you don't need anything more, but then when you start doing uh, a visual field on them when you start doing electroretinogram ERG on these patients you start finding there's significant uh, deficiency and and oftentimes it's very late. I mean by the time you find these defects some of these are not reversible. No, they're photoreceptor damage permanently and uh, so you want to sort of you know get get yourself to the right person if you do have birth shot or your friends have birth shot, your family have birth shot, um, uh, you get them to the correct expert so that they really know how to monitor these patients and, and treat it appropriately. And don't let your local guy just say, hey, you're 20, 20, you, you, don't, you don't need anything more than just observation. Because we've seen those train wrecks before and there's it's too late by the time their photoreceptors are wiped, wiped out. <clears throat> it's actually very common for a bird shot patient to be 2020 and have horrific mm -hmm. vision. Um, quality of vision quality. and the number in their in their visual acuity based on the chart that you read it are quite different from each other. And um, <clears throat> that's something that the people who actually know a little bit more about bird shot will recognize very swiftly and know, you know, to be more aggressive about medications when you need. And the one thing about bird shot that's nice and it goes along with Dr. Shaw's talk. Uh, is the steroid uh, injectables or implants that are available because birdshot has this nice quality about it that is not associated with a systemic inflammatory disorder where you're worried about joints or skin or other GI types of things going on. Uh, and you can give a local therapy for the eyes and keep them under control for quite a long time. And, and, and patients are very, very happy that way sometimes when they don't uh, want to use an immunosuppressive or they can't for whatever reason. Um, that's a great option for them. So it's something to always remember. <laughs> yeah. and so oh, go ahead, Claudia. <laughs> Thank you so much for your feedback. Appreciate it. Sure. See Andrea you. had our yeah. hand up. I just have a quick question. Has the uveitis or ocular inflammatory world gotten any better at figuring out from Jump Street how uveitis, certain people's uveitis is mediated so we go to the proper drug? Is there any genetic testing or anything that has come up to help with that so that you don't have to try so many different drugs if you kind of know how it's mediated to begin with? I think the one problem with doing that and targeting something so specifically is the fact that the immune system is so interregulated. Everything's sort of involved with everything. There are mechanisms of disease that are a little bit better understood. For example, birdshot is primarily a T-cell driven disease. So some of the medications that Dr. Foster has jumped up for that target the T-cells that attack the retina. But not all diseases are as well understood or necessarily as compartmentalized as something like that. So, and, and, and to be honest, the, 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 the knowledge that they gained about birdshot was fairly luckily, I think, obtained by a, a, a an autopsy of a patient who with birdshot who died like outside of a hospital, some weird story like that. Mm. But you don't really get to find that type of thing out very often. So unfortunately, it's not as easy to target specific things mm. rather, um, or maybe not even able to, but you just kind of try and see what works uh, with various approaches to suppressing different parts or signals in the immune system. And, and it may be that one patient with one disease responds to one and then another response to another and vice versa. They, they, they don't respond to each other's medications. It's very different depending on which patient that you're, um, you're, you're working with. So. Yeah, and rather than, uh, I guess, Andrea, I mean, you're, I, I totally get your questions and I know why it's so, you know, it's a pra practically speaking, it's very, you know, it'd be nice to know, hey, if the patient's gonna <laughs> fail methotrexate or something, we should, we should just skip that drug. But 
what we've been doing and other groups have been doing is sort of identify sort of so-called high risk features of each different kinds of uveitis and say, hey, you know, if you had this and this and that, then maybe, you know, you want to be more aggressive, not specifically about what medicine to pull off the shelf, but at least you want, might want to consider being more aggressive. So for example, since we're, um, we're talking about birdshot just now, I mean, recently our, um, our, one of our research fellows, um, Arash, uh, uh, Meliki and us, we just pre, uh, pre, uh, published a paper. Uh, we're trying to uh, actually, he just wrote a paper and we're trying to get it published right now on what are some of the high risk characteristics in birdshot that can indicate that the disease is much tougher to treat and less re, uh, less likely to respond to uh, what we typically use as first line. So I think we're, we're always trying to look for these sort of clinical characteristics, if not genetically, um, at least we're trying to find features that can kind of say, okay, I, I don't want to, you know, watch this patient on just one drug too long. I want to sort of, you know, it, be ready to shift gear, um, you know, sooner. You know, I think one of the things Thanks. That, that, you know, I think Dr. Foster and, and Mercy has done is they've looked at flow cytometry, looking at cell levels. And, I, you know, other groups are starting to look at this, not on the same large scale that we need to. <laughs> but unfortunately, um, I think it, it's an intriguing idea to judge therapy. If we can truly work out flow cytometry and look at cell populations over the course of someone's treatment. We might know when to truly hold a medicine or patients, you know, because certain levels don't appear of certain cell populations, we may have to keep them, you know, treat them indefinitely. And I think that's an area where we're getting closer to understanding. I think the pathophysiology for all the diffuse causes of uveitis is still gonna be a black box for the next couple of years. I think we just don't have enough people looking at this in the rigorous fashion that we, to give us the answers you, to your question. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a question here from Randolph. Uh, is there any evidence that any of the COVID vaccines are less effective if you have an autoimmune disease? What if you have been on immunomodulators in the past but are are not on them currently? Um, yeah, so these are is, these are the questions that we've been getting since March to 2020. Every single day, I feel like every day, somebody calls about, hey, what should I do with my methotrexate, Humira? You know, uh, should I stop it? Well, so that's be, the pre-vaccine time. Uh, we usually tell patients, you know, you got to you got to keep you know taking your uh, immunomodulatory therapy to keep your infection in check. Um, but uh, but since I think we got even more questions now. Now that the vaccines are available, because people are always asking us, okay, should I stop my medicine before I get my vaccines so that I can actually produce antibody? And I think this is something that there's really no definitive evidence. And I, I've been hearing different rheumatologists doing different things. And I really, I think it comes down to what particular therapy, particular immunomodulatory therapy you're on, and also what is the sort of the the risk tolerance here if we stop your medicine? What What's the risk of you having something flare up in your eye? that can potentially damage your vision versus the risk of getting COVID and, you know, and not do well from it. So I think that's, it's, it's, it's a tough, complex question. Um, it's funny that just this morning, I have a patient who's getting IV uh, Remicade and she was just, we were just talking about this and, and, uh, and she said she actually had an antibody check and she actually, uh, after her vaccine and just because her PCP wanted to know if she actually form antibody and she never caught COVID as far as we know that not not symptomatic COVID anyway and she actually had antibody even though she was on methotrexate and Remicade this entire time and she got Remicade every month methotrexate every week she was still able to form <clears throat> um, the the anti-COVID uh, antibody after two shots of uh, Pfizer vaccine so I mean I think part of the confusion is the fact that when you get the COVID vaccine we really don't know what mechanism of the immune system is giving you the immunity um, we know how to assay for antibody titers, but the cell mediated immunity might be completely intact, even if you're on immune suppression. So, you know, my experience is that patients, you know, who have been on immune suppression in my clinics with COVID vaccine have been protected. You know, some have drawn their, you know, and just like Pete was, was, what Peter was talking about, the antibody titers are all over the map. You know, some are undetectable, some get, have just low titers. Um, but I, I don't, um, you know, I always recommend either the Pfizer or the Moderna. Um, and, I think there's just a lot we don't know, and we're going to get these answers hopefully in six months as they study the kind of the organ transplant and cancer populations. Yeah, we'll see about all of that. Um, as far as how patients with autoimmune disease in general uh, respond to vaccinations, you shouldn't have any less effectivity if, um, if you're getting a vaccination. If you're on an immunosuppressive, there's, like the other two doctors have said, been questions of whether or not it's going to be effective. But these immunosuppressives that we're giving are not cranking down on the immune system so hard 
that it's not working at all. People still generally avoid getting ill on a regular basis like you normally would. Um, so you should respond to a vaccination pretty appropriately, whether or not you skip your medication, whether or not you're on medication, almost all the time. Does it make you maybe have a slight less chance of having a, an antibody response to a vaccination? Sure. Um, and who's to say that antibody that you develop is even going to protect you very much against the disease? Everything's a big question mark. You know, we don't tell people with the flu vaccination every year that we give to stop their immune, med immune medications. At that point, we don't, I think, necessarily tell people who get vaccinations for travel uh, for exotic diseases to stop their medications when they get vaccinated for those. We do tell people to avoid getting live vaccinations or attenuated vaccinations that aren't what we call a, a dead organism. So they give a, a weakened version of a virus, for example, and that's supposed to help induce immunity. That's not acceptable if you're on an immunosuppressive. It may not be the greatest idea if you have an immune uh, autoimmune disease either. Um, if you've been on immunomodulatory medication in the past, not on them right now, you should have a normally functioning immune system because those medications typically don't have a long-term effect on bone marrow suppression. Um, you should be able to you know, produce a, a, a very normal antibody response to any vaccination challenge that you receive. So, <clears throat> hope that answers your question, Randall. Any other questions? Looking for hands raised. Oh, and we are, that's funny because right before the meeting, uh, Dr. Nisi and I are just reviewing a little uh, manuscript that one of our fellow just wrote uh, on COVID vaccine related uh, inflammatory flare up. So it's funny, uh, because, but we have seen them. We have seen patients who come in shortly after they got their vaccines and they do have some uveitis flare up or, or any type of ocular inflammatory <clears throat> disease like scleritis, um, episcleritis flare up. So it's interesting, but it makes sense because the immune system is, um, you know, is vaccine associated uveitis has been documented for many, many years. So uh, just with regular flu vaccine. So it makes sense because the, uh, because, because, the, you know, you're, you're trying to agitate your immune system to create these antibody and like Steve was saying before the, in, in, in the there's so much interplay between the different, branches of the immune system that, you know, you just never, you can never predict who, what's going to happen in who. So, uh, but yeah, no, we do see some uveitis flare up, OID flare up uh, after vaccines, but it's not a reason not to get vaccine. So I think, we, you know, you can, you can always treat the inflammation with steroids and whatnot short term anyway, uh, but you know, the, but the protection from the vaccine is probably the ben benefit of that is far always the risk. We have another question here um, about diet in treating ocular inflammation, uh, one patient, uh, Joyce, who's been a uveitis patient for nine years, taken Humira in the past and not for almost a couple years, changed her diet, not eating gluten or dairy, and hasn't had any inflammation. So do we think that diet is the only way to be cured? Um, certainly not. Uh, you know, there's lots of ways to effectively be in long-term remission, uh, slash cure, depending on the that. Diet is certainly something that a lot of patients have expressed to me as a positive part of their, uh, their sort of course. And, and patients who, who have tried um, to cut out gluten or dairy or a lot of sugary products, those are all pro-inflammatory um, food items, um, have had some luck or better luck in controlling inflammation when they didn't have as much before. I don't ever advocate for that because to be honest, um, cutting those things out of your Diet can also induce a lot of stress, which can also be pro-inflammatory. But if you're able to do it and you're happy about it and it works for you, I don't necessarily dissuade people away from it either. So it's certainly something to try if you want, um, by all means, uh, if you can do it, because I'm not sure I could. So anyways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'll be very sad. Definitely, definitely a, a something to think about if you're having a tough time. Uh, it's actually very interesting. Last week, I, I just I, I met up with a buddy of mine that I haven't we haven't I haven't seen in a while, and uh, he has psoriatic arthritis. He's in maybe his early forties. He's been having psoriatic arthritis for for se at least seven or eight years now, and he's always done well on Embro, uh, which is a, one of the earliest biologics that came out before even Humira was on the market uh, for probably twenty years now. And he was actually so he would need he was this is self injectable, and he was doing Embro probably every month while he was having his be really best psoriatic arthritis. And he's a very healthy guy, doesn't smoke, runs all the time. Uh, and he tried different diets and he didn't really help. And then 
starting about two years ago, he started doing this uh, intermittent fasting. He was just telling me, because I do that too, but that's just for my weight loss. But he actually started doing intermittent fasting. I don't know if you guys have heard of this concept, but it's becoming pretty popular. So he basically goes uh, <clears throat> 16 hours uh, each day without eating. He only eat eight hours. So he goes from 8 p.m. He basically doesn't in intake. It doesn't take any calories between 8 p.m. to 12 p.m. next day. So he basically skipped breakfast. He doesn't eat anything be between dinner and lunch next day. And he tells me at first he started doing the intermittent fasting. Now he gets himself embryo every 15 months. <laughs> so he hasn't required, whenever he gets joints, joint swelling, he, he gave himself a shot. He hasn't had a shot in 15 months. Since. And he said the biggest difference is the intermittent fasting. And there's actually a very good um, New England Journal of Medicine article on intermittent fasting uh, from December 2019. Uh, talking about the very, very different benefits of intermittent mm -hmm. fasting, how it's uh, anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory, and of course, helping weight loss, and people have used it for diabetic control. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, and uh, so I encourage you to look into it, not that I'm, I'm, I'm because I'm doing it, not that I'm, but it actually really works. I think my I, I, I lost a lot of weight, and uh, and I feel great. And, uh, and now there's another uh, a friend of mine that actually has uh, autoimmune condition that that has significant benefit and, and, and intermittent fasting might be better than any of the diets you can actually uh, talk about because these diets i mean you, you're, you're if you follow a certain regimen that helps you you're gonna have to do that for the rest of your life right mm -hmm. uh at least while your autoimmune disease is active but this intermittent fasting thing is i think it's good for uh, from many standpoints so yeah i encourage you to look into it yeah and then you know there's a lot of work being done in the gut microbiome and and so for those who aren't familiar the microbiome is the bacteria in our guts uh, there's also just the fact that the gut is an endocrine organ and even an, an immune modulatory organ in, in, is what the thought is. And I think there's a lot we don't know. Um, you know, I remain a little, um, I would say, conservative about the effect of the microbiome and the gut for uvi management. Um, I think that uh, you can certainly do lifestyle management in diets like uh, Peter was talking about, but I still think if you have bad disease, uh, and you're losing ground, I think, um, I don't think at this point our, our ability to exploit the gut and the microbiome is enough to save vision. So I wouldn't do it in spite of treatment uh, if you're doing poorly. But if it's working, I'm, that's great. I think there's plenty we still don't know about the immune system and, and the mechanisms of, of therapy. All right, any other questions or... Um curiosities out there that anybody has something that we're missing i don't know if anybody wants allison francis anybody seeing anything that we're not seeing i think peter needs to do a study on intermittent fasting <laughs> i have and I'm... inflammation <laughs> yeah well, i want to i want to thank you know i think we all want to thank malincroft for making this very important um venue for 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 all on the call and for those in the the internet sphere possible you know, I think this is, um, you know, just a valuable endeavor just to talk about the field and where it's going and, and also uh, how we, how, you know, what we've seen, especially in these COVID times. I think this has been educated for all of us and I want to thank again um, all of you for spending the night and for Malincroft for making this possible. Thank you. Thank, yes. thank you, Raj. Wow, the Raj, the turnover there is very long. You guys oh, can exactly. You don't even know. Your case, your case to start. That's amazing. <laughs> I thought you had to leave like 40 minutes ago. Yeah. Oh, no, it's... Hospital. hospital. I'll, be, I'll be here for a while. <laughs> Great to see you all. Thank you. Oh, I think we have another question. Let's see. Yes. Hold on. What type of follow-up do you recommend for posterior uveitis and how often... Do ocular testing, visual field, et cetera? Uh, Sue, so that's a great question. I think that depends on the disease. I think there, uh, we talked about birdshot as a prototypical disease. Uh, we know that in that particular disease, fluorescent angiograms, uh, we know that um, visual fields do have predictive value along with electrical testing. Um, there's some, you know, if you're primarily an anterior segment inflammation uh, without glaucoma, I think that probably aside from your a clinical exam in, in a seasoned uh, clinic, um, probably there's less testing that's going to be helpful for right now. Unfortunately, things like flare meters, um, you know, various ways to grade cell in, a, in an objective fashion are still highly variable. And so um, I'd say probably the posterior segment inflammation, pan uveitis is probably loan themselves more to frequent testing and, and probably more frequent follow-ups because they tend to be more visually devastating. But then if you have a bad glaucoma component of your uveitis, that can require just as frequent, if not more visits, to keep you from going, losing ground and going blind. 
Personally, I don't think I follow them anterior versus posterior much differently. I follow based on activity of inflammation, severity, and other symptoms that may be going on, things like pressure, things like systemic disease, flaring, um, whatever it is. Um, you know, if people are under control and doing well on a medication, they just need to stay eight weeks or so. Uh, if they require something a little bit more um, aggressive or they're going through something acute, I'll see them you know, every couple of days to a week or two, you know, it really kind of depends. But regularly, it doesn't really matter what kind of inflammation. If they're on medications that require that much monitoring, it's usually every six to eight weeks. Yep. And I, I definitely uh, think uh, angiogram, fluorescing angiography is over, uh, definitely underutilized. Uh, we do a lot of angiogram at Mercy uh, because it shows really, it, it, it shows you a lot more than that. No pun intended, that meets the eye. So it's, uh, it, there's, Especially when it comes to posterior uveitis, uh, there's a there's a lot of things that you that leaks that you don't even you, the eye might look pretty quiet, uh, but you do the angiogram and boom, there's leakage everywhere. And based on that, we often <coughs> will um, adjust our therapy accordingly. And uh, and I think people are undertreated if they're not getting angiogram. But it depends depends on the uh, exact type of uveitis you have because uveitis is such a heterogeneous entity. There's so many different kinds, even just within posterior uveitis, so many different cause types of you posterior uveitis so the way you do do um imaging and testing is very different but definitely i think angiogram is something that uh, i think uh, a lot of patients can probably benefit from at least having done every few months just to kind of make sure the therapy you're, you're on is actually treating your inflammation completely and not that's just at vitreous cells or haze you know that's that's more than that and not just looking at oh whether there's fluid on your macula on the oct yeah that's awesome. Thanks so much. Um, it's my husband. Uh, he uh, was diagnosed uh, just about two years ago, sort of with this just acute inflammation. And it was picked up by an optometrist um, because they had just purchased um, an OCT scanner. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, we found out that my husband is severely allergic to the uh, fluorescein dye. Wow. They did get a picture done, but he was incredibly ill um, and developed an anaphylactic reaction uh, post um, uh, assessment. So they've been doing OCT every mm -hmm. eight weeks. And we finally got, uh, we're in Canada, we're in Nova Scotia, Canada, and uh, he's in the military sort of at the mm -hmm. end of his career, 59 years of age. Um, and they finally but he was on sort of this dose of prednisone. We started with the blast of uh, 1250, uh, you know, IV for three days and then whacked him at 60 milligrams for four months and then 50 milligrams for two months. And we did this for about 18 months, finally got him down to about five milligrams. And then the, um, the, the inflammation just went sort of crazy. So we got a second opinion from a neuro-ophthalmologist who said, why haven't you been on Humira? And so, uh, and the problem is too, he's got a family history positive for wet macular degeneration. So they didn't really know whether or not some of this could be potentially an uh, influence of some early macular degeneration, but they, they don't believe it is. Uh, so, so we're just kind of waiting it out. We're about three months into Humira. Uh, once every two weeks and um, to know whether or not he would have a better response uh, if in fact he were taking the injections once a week. Um, but in Canada, they are fairly, um, you know, they're, they're very hesitant to kind of go beyond the label. And I actually would like to get him down to Mersey uh, just for even a sort of a, a third opinion because this is what you folks specialize in, so. Yeah, uh, but, I mean, if you, if you can do weekly, I would at least recommend adding something to the Humira. Humira every two yeah. weeks, it sounds like he has a pretty significant disease that needed this much steroids for almost two years. So probably if you, they, they won't allow weekly, at least add a methotrexate on top of it. I think that will probably be better than just doing it all right. on Humira alone. So whenever they... Yeah, and whenever they see uh, when they when, when you say they do OCT to look for inflammation, they're talking about fluid, then right? I assume because they see fluid, they just assume presume that is related to inflammation. That's correct. Yeah, and that's that's fine because that I mean with an angiogram, that's unfortunate that you know you can't do an angiogram on him anymore. But 
but uh, but yeah, no, that maybe that is you know yeah. So it, it is definitely tougher um, when when you just use an OCT because not all UVI does comes with fluid, but in his case it does. So so uh, you could I guess you could you could definitely use that as a sort of a, a surrogate marker uh, for having inflammation. That's probably the best best you're gonna have. Um, uh, and, and the leakage from inflammation is very, very different from leakage of wet macular degeneration. So, I mean, if you just show me his OCT, I can probably instantly tell you whether it's inflammatory or it's from wet macular degeneration. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, you, I just, um, it has been a godsend to find you folks because, you know, up until about six months ago, we had no idea that you existed. And uh, um, it was just because um, I read a paper uh, by you folks uh, that, that you'd done and I just um, sort of jumped out of my seat. So anyway, I think we may be planning a trip to uh, Boston to come have a, to come have a, an assessment. So yeah, not, not too far. It's a nice, nice drive down. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. For, for really? everybody listening, Sue's story is exactly why this foundation does what it does. And the every single publication and, and, and outreach and little bit of education that we provide can make a difference in even just one person's life, you know, just finding out about this. And you can you can see the amount of steroid that her husband has been on is a lot longer than we would ever mm -hmm. advocate for, and to get now into a different mode of treatment is 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 super super helpful for for them. So any any, any anything you know any type of support that we see from the foundation really does go quite a long way. And we actually put a plug in for you folks um, with our neuro ophthalmology folks here in uh, Halifax um, because they. They had no idea that you folks existed, and so I gave them copies of the papers and uh, and also uh, gave them the link uh, so that they could see the great work that you've been doing. So, anyway, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And one thing just that we you know this like this COVID year really has a. Uh, you know, make these type of meeting more, more like sort of everyone's so used to these type of Zoom meeting now. So yeah, no, definitely. I think hoping we can actually get more international uh, exposure this way so more people can actually, we used to that, have, we have patient support group physically in, in the office. So there's no way you, you or your husband would have ever made it down here on, on, the, on the Wednesday evening. But now, you know, you can actually talk to us like this. So it's great. Thanks, Thank Nicole. you so much. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's it, right? That's all the, and that that's about the timing is perfect. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. It was a great evening. Thank you, all the doctors and participants and patients. Um, Allison, is this going to be uh, recorded? This is recorded. Or putting on the website. Yep, we'll put it on the website. Awesome. Awesome. Right. And look for more information for the next uh, conference in September, which will be at Duke, and will be hybrid, and that will be offered on demand as well, like this one. And like I said at the beginning of the talk, that this, the um, the original OID crash course where Raj's talk was included, will be offered through the end of August, so you can still watch that on demand. Thank awesome. you so much. I think it's Dr. Shaw's time to go to surgery. Good luck. Yeah. If anybody <laughs> wants to reference... Timing. The way that we do things at, at, at Mercy and through IOF, by the way, last really little plug, um, there is a white paper that we produced about five years ago that basically gives our entire way of treating ocular inflammation, and it's available. Um, uh, your doctor survey. should be able to find that uh, on the survey of ophthalmology. So if you 2016, it, yeah, 2000. You can, if you want, you can contact me, and I can get it for you. Very good. Exactly. You got a free copy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, Doctor Chang and Doctor Anisi. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thanks.